What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Prison Brides, Season 1, Episode 4, Second Degree Engagement. So this week, we have a new couple. We have Gabriella and Jamal. So Gabriella is 26 years old. She's from Lithuania, but she's currently living in Germany. And when we see Gabriella, she is working in a coffee shop. The coffee shop is owned by her sister, and she tells us that she met Jamal through a prison pen pal website. Now, Jamal is 28 years old. He is serving 22 to 40 years for second degree murder. And I'm not exactly sure what state he's in, but obviously he is in a maximum security prison in the United States. And his earliest release date is 2038. The kicker is is that she believes that he's been wrongfully convicted. He has convinced her that he has been wrongfully convicted and he's actually innocent of this crime of second degree murder. So the next time that we see Gabriella, um, she's with her sister, her and her sister having a conversation. Her sister is extremely frustrated with her because she's in this relationship with this inmate. Um, her sister doesn't understand why she won't choose, you know, like a regular guy who can, you know, walk about in the free world. Uh, but you know, Gabriella, Gabriella, she's in love. You can't tell her anything. So while she's talking to her sister, um, Jamal calls her from prison and she takes the call and he talks about, you know, a flower that can grow in darkness. It's a sign of survival or it's a miracle. He tries to be all philosophical. You know how it is, right? With the people in prison, they have a lot of time to try to get real philosoph philosophical about life. So he talks about a flower growing in darkness, how this is symbolic of him, I guess, you know, he's this flower in darkness because he's still thriving and surviving, even though he's incarcerated and she starts to cry. And he's like, well, I didn't want you to, I didn't, I'm not telling you this because I wanted to make you cry. This is like a good story. It's a, it's a sign of positivity or something. And she's like, yeah, I know, but it's still making me cry. She got really emotional over this. So then the next time that we see her, she is on the computer and she's doing research on wrongfully convicted criminals. And she's on the phone with him and they're talking about what what can be done to try to get this, try to get him released, try to get this case overturned. And of course, it's going to require lots of money. I guess if you have to go through an attorney, I don't know if they're going to go through um, an association like the Innocence Project or whatever, but we get to know more about this actual crime that he was convicted of. So when he was about 15 years old, his best friend was murdered and they pinned the murder on Jamal. And Jamal says that there was no evidence whatsoever that connected him to his friend's murder. There was no fingerprints. There was no DNA. There was absolutely no physical evidence. In fact, he even had an alibi and the alibi, um, held water. Basically, whoever he said he was with at the time that his friend was being killed, they confirmed or they whatever they said that yes, Jamal was with us during that time. But the alibi and the lack of evidence was not enough to prevent him from being convicted. Now, what ended up convicting him, I guess the strongest um, evidence that they had was the testimony from his own mother. And the mother had testified in court that Jamal had confessed to her that he had killed his best friend. And that's what did it. So of course, to me, all of this is extremely fishy because I watch a lot of true crime TV. I, I watch more than what would be need, what would be deemed normal. Okay. Um, I'm addicted to true crime television. And even if you have a confession, whether from the person themselves or from anyone else, and I don't even, okay, either from a person themselves or from anybody else, if you, if there's a confession, it has to be followed up or proven by evidence. Even if you yourself confess to committing a crime, you confessing is not enough. There has to be evidence to back it up. So whatever the mom said, they had to have had evidence to back it up because who knows why she would say this um, if it wasn't true. Obviously, you know, she could have said it because her and her son are not getting along. She could have said it maybe because she has, you know, uh, mental illness or some type of mental health problem. She could have said it because she was intoxicated. There's a, a plethora of reasons of why a mother would say something so shocking about her own child. So 
I'm pretty sure law enforcement did their due diligence in backing up what she said with actual evidence. It wasn't just her coming into court saying, oh, my son told me he did it. And they're like, okay, even though we don't have any evidence, we're going to go with what you're saying and we're going to put him in prison for 22 to 40 years. It just makes no sense to me at all. But he has been able to convince Gabriella that he's innocent. And so she's going to be spending all of her free time and possibly her money in trying to get his case uh, looked at again and possibly overturned and have him released from prison. Okay, good luck to y'all with all of that. We have another new couple. We have Olivia and Kevin. So Olivia is 26 years old. She is um, from the UK. She's a dance teacher. And Kevin is in, I thought it was St. Louis, Missouri, but on the TV, it said St. Louis, Michigan. So I was kind of confused about that. I didn't know there was a St. Maybe there was a St. Louis in Michigan. Who knows? So he is doing um, eight years for home invasion and he's already completed six and a half years and he has about 20 months left. They met through another prison pal, prison pen pal website, but they have actually also seen each other in person uh, when she has gone to go visit him. Olivia says that when they first saw each other in person, it was love at first sight. Of course it was love at first sight because <laughs> I mean, what is, what is he going to tell you? He's going to be like, uh, no, I don't like you. Uh, you're not my type. Go away. No, he's going to also say there was love at first sight for him as well, because he needs to have that support outside of the prison. So, um, she's having a conversation with her friend. Um, and her friend is telling her how apprehensive she feels about Olivia dating this inmate. And Olivia is looking at her like completely perplexed. And she's just like, why are you so apprehensive? And I'm like, girl, what? Your friend is apprehensive because you're dating an inmate. You're dating a criminal. That's why she's apprehensive. She's worried about you. So the plan is um, for her to move to the United States on a spousal visa because that would be the quickest way, I think, or the easiest way for her to come to America. She wants to leave the UK. She's a dance teacher. And she says that in the UK, they don't take dance as seriously as they do in the United States. So it's to pursue her career and to also be with her man. But in order for them to get married he has to have a birth certificate now the issue is is that Kevin was adopted so there's been some type of confusion as far as what exactly happened to his original birth certificate um, the birth mom says she doesn't have it the adoptive parents uh, they claim that they don't have it either and they're also not communicating with Olivia nobody from his family is communicating with Olivia at all and so she's kind of like doing this all on her own and trying to obtain this birth certificate for him so so, um, she says that, you know, Kevin has given her the world and I want to see evidence of this. What world has he given you? I want to see this. I want you to, to show us this world that Kevin has given you because he's behind bars. How has he given you the world, Olivia? How? So, um, she's going to be going back. To, she's going to be coming to the United States, uh, because she's going to try to do whatever she can either to get this birth certificate from his family or to help him get a brand new birth certificate. So she arrives in the United States and the only person that she really has any contact with is, um, a friend of his by the name of Tyreek. While she's in her hotel, she tries to call Kevin's adoptive mother, leaves messages, text her voicemail, and the woman is just not responding at all. So the only one that she's in communication with is um, Tyreek. So before she meets up with Tariq, she does go to the prison to see Kevin. And she has on every time, you know, I guess this just applies to anybody who visits whoever behind bars. You have to be dressed appropriately. There's this very strict dress code. So she always brings like an extra change of clothes just in case whatever she's already wearing doesn't pass the dress code. So she arrives at the prison and she's wearing, it was like a pink t-shirt, some jeans, I think, and some peak tennis shoes so she goes inside the prison immediately they kick her out because her dress they said I mean not her dress her shirt they said um was too tight because you could see the outline of her bra from beneath her shirt so luckily she had a change of clothes so she goes in and she changes to something a little bit more appropriate and her visit with him lasts about two hours and she tells us when she comes out that Kevin is really upset that nobody from his family is willing to help finding this damn birth certificate because everything hinges on the birth certificate they need it for them to get married which then after that they can then go ahead and apply for the spousal visa to get her over here 
So she's supposed to meet up with Tyreek. She calls Tyreek and Tyreek is like, you know, yeah, I'll meet you up at whatever place at 10 a.m. the next day. The next day comes. She shows up at the place where they're supposed to meet. Tyreek is a no call, no show. She calls him several times, leaves several messages and he does not respond. His calls go, her calls to him go straight to voicemail. And so Olivia tells us, I'm beginning to see now whenever Kevin was telling me that, you know, the people in his family and his friends are not really reliable or dependable they're not really trying to help him she's like yeah I'm beginning to really see that now so in addition to dating someone that you have no physical contact with who has no freedom these women are doing a lot of legwork in in whatever the hell they're doing whether it's trying to get their convictions overturned or they're looking for documents and paperwork for these men or they're trying to find a place to live they're doing a whole lot of legwork for someone who most likely is going to end up leaving you once they're released moving on from there we have Jessica and Craig. Now we met Jessica and Craig before. Jessica has moved to the United States already and she's from Australia. Her and Craig are already married. They had a prison wedding. They've been together for a couple of years and this is the one, uh, Craig is the inmate that from the age of 12 to the age of 35, he only had three and a half years of freedom because he kept on um, committing crimes and going back to prison over and over again. So he's about to be released. He's done with his 10 year sentence for something to do with stealing. I don't know if it was robbery. I think it was robbery or burglary, something to do with stealing. So he's about to be released now. So Jessica, his wife is hanging out with his sister. I think her name is Mika. And they're hanging out. They're trying to, you know, get things ready for the prison release party that they're going to be throwing for Craig. And they're also simultaneously going to be also throwing a birthday party for him. And as they're, you know, doing all this shopping for the for the party, um, the sister is talking about how she's really worried that her brother Craig, once he's released, he might reoffend and go back to prison because that has been his pattern since the age of twelve. So she's really worried about that and. Jessica tells us that um, if her husband ends up going back to prison, she is out of here. She says life for her is a lot better in Australia, career rock, career wise. Um, she's got, you know, family there. So for her, living in Australia is a lot better than living in America. She's just sacrificing to be with Craig. So if he messes up again and ends up back in prison, she's going right back to Australia, never to look back. So then we see the day that he is released. Um, Craig tells us that he is a new man. He has turned over a brand new leaf, that he is not the same Craig that was, you know, stealing just to survive. He no longer, he says he no longer has the need to steal because in prison, he learned a trade. He's a welder. He was also the one that was doing the work release program where he was working as a welder while in prison and making money. And he was able to save like $35,000 already from welding. So he's like, I have a job, I have a skill, so I have no need to go back to the streets to do anything because I can be self-sufficient now. I have a wife, so I have a great support system. You know, he has a place to live. So everything is working out for him when he is released. Everything is ready for him upon his release. So he's finally released. Um, we have uh, his wife, Jessica, there, plus his sister, Mika, to meet him. And... <laughs> Y'all, what that girl, what Jessica, his wife had on, I was just like, what are we doing? And I've seen this before on Love After Lockup that when the men get released from prison, the women will have on like the most skimpiest thing. And I'm just like, you don't have to show up in a suit. Okay. And you don't have to show up looking all drab in like a, a, a jogging suit or, um, well, it could be a cute jogging suit. It doesn't have to be drab just because it's a jogging suit or you don't have to show up looking dowdy or whatever, but can we add a little bit of taste? She had on this, um, I guess it was like, um, a jumper overalls, but it was shorts and it was like cotton material. And I didn't think it was very flattering to her body. 
and it had the straps and she wore nothing underneath and not even a bra and you got a lot of side boobage and I'm just like what are we doing why are you wearing that on the day that you're supposed to greet your man from being released from prison you could be attractive you could be sexy but you don't have to be you know anyways so yeah the point is is that Craig now is released he is out and um he got in that car and he drove them home uh he could not wait to do that so yeah he didn't you know I was like okay so you still have your license after 10 years of being incarcerated you still have your driver's license I guess he did because he's the one that took over the wheel and drove them home so good for them then um last but not least we have Sevea and Joseph now Sevea is the young lady from Germany and who came to America upon her her um her boyfriend's release they're not engaged they're not married um she's already had seen him already in prison a couple of times so now he's about to now he he, he he has been released he is out and so they were staying in a hotel um for a day or two and now they're going to move into joseph's cousin's basement neither one of them was looking forward to it um Savea talks about how she needs to be around fresh air and open windows but there they're, there they are in the damn basement now she's not living in the basement with him she's gonna be going back to Germany pretty soon but while she's here they are going to be staying in the basement together and she wanted the basement to be real co uh, like cozy and homely so she bought an area rug she got um an actual bed Joseph thought he was just gonna sleep on an air mattress down there but she got him an actual bed with a headboard there's a couch down there to make it look really homey and comfortable and cozy so um, he really did like that he liked the fact that she put in that much effort for him so after that they we see them they're going out to eat and they're having a conversation about their future and he says he wants to get her pregnant by July I don't know what month they're filming this in but he was like we well, you know what if you know I get you pregnant by July and I'm like oh hell no <laughs> please don't do that <laughs> no um no <laughs> they have a lot of work to do because first of all you have to get to know each other you have to get to know each other you have to you know y'all this there's no we're not talking about babies Joseph get that out of your mind y'all have to see if y'all are compatible if y'all can get along if y'all can live together without killing each other um and the plan is for them to move to Germany after he completes his probation so after he completes his probation he's going to start a whole new life in a whole new country and you don't want to add the stress of a child to all of that so but at least he's talking about getting a job as well so he talks about how he wants to get a job where he can work Monday through Friday and then he wants to get a second job that he can work during the weekend so he's talking a good game okay he's talking a really good game Joseph we just need you to follow through with the action so we'll see if all of that is actually going to come into fruition and then it's time for Savea to leave to go back to Germany and yeah that's what she did I mean it wasn't like some long drawn out teary goodbye you know she got in her car and she drove to the airport and that was the end of that <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Please don't forget to rate the video. If you like this content, please subscribe to my channel and I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.